ladies and gentlemen, Farnam Jahanian, President, Carnegie Mellon University. Well, good afternoon. Okay, we're going to try this again. Good afternoon. Oh, much better, much better. It is my great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you as we kick off this inaugural CMU KNL Gates Conference on Ethics and Artificial Intelligence. Before I get started, we pick this date in April because we knew that this would be the third week of spring, and especially for many of our friends and colleagues from the Bay Area, from the West Coast, and uh, from Texas, we knew that you wanted to enjoy spring in Pittsburgh. So you are welcome. <laughs> I'm really happy to welcome all of you uh, on behalf of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon. We're joined here today by several of our trustees and members of the university leadership team and by a wide array of distinguished CMU faculty and thought leaders from across the country. Uh, you will hear from them uh, throughout the day today and tomorrow. As one of Carnegie Mellon's newest initiatives and annual traditions, this conference brings together thought leaders from diverse perspectives to discuss the ethical, social, and policy ramifications brought on by advances in artificial intelligence and computational technologies. This two-day event has been made possible by an exceptional coalition of support. First, I want to take a moment to thank our extraordinary partners at k &L Gates. Ever since we began discussing the possibility of this new forum, I've been impressed by the thoughts and foresight of our KNL Gate partners who understood the far-reaching the effects of these new technologies not only in the legal world but also throughout society and they've been willing to invest in work to make sure that these technologies and these unprecedented advances that we see benefit society and benefits humanity. Because of their generosity, KNL Gates Endowment for Ethics and Computational Technologies will advance research and education in this critical domain and foster dialogues like this week's conference. I'm delighted to welcome several representatives from KNL Gates this afternoon, including Jim Segerdahl, global managing partner who will provide remarks in just a few minutes, Michael Cussis, chairman of the management committee, and David Lehman, partner and co-head of the KNL Gates Artificial Intelligence Initiative. And I should note that Michael is also a proud CMU alum, Dietrich College, class of 82. Michael was 10 years old when he graduated from college. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming and thanking all of our partners from KNL Gates. I'm also pleased to acknowledge uh, all of our conference speakers and panelists, including uh, my friend Eric Horvitz, director of Microsoft Research Lab, who is here today as our distinguished speaker for this event. Welcome, Eric. Uh, preparing such an extraordinary agenda requires exceptional leadership. So I'm grateful to the conference organizers, the steering committee, and of course, my uh, colleagues, the co-chairs, David Danks and Ilan Norbach. Finally, this conference has been supported by countless professionals, including Dorothy Robinson of Council at KNL Gates and the entire planning committee at Carnegie Mellon and at KNL Gates. Please join me in thanking all of our special guests as well as our conference organizers. There is little doubt that emerging technologies and artificial intelligence are at the center of an ongoing economic and societal transformation that will no doubt will continue for decades to come. As we embrace the Internet of Things, unprecedented access 
to a massive amount of data. And the rise of automation and robotics. We're barreling toward a future run by cyber-enabled systems. While these technologies will enhance our comfort, security, and quality of life uh, for society, for, for all of us, their deployment has had unprecedented consequences for our workforce, our education system, potentially for social justice, for fairness, for privacy, and many other aspects of society. The effect of technology on society is not a brand new concern. But as we see these emerging technologies pervade every aspect of our lives and disrupt markets and disrupt industries, these issues have become even more urgent. Consider for a moment a few phenomena of our technology-driven world. As data has become a new currency for business and for technology, we're seeing a dramatic surge in the collection, storage, analysis, and monetization of our personal and often most sensitive data. Meanwhile, the most cherished attributes of the internet and the web, its speed, its reach, its openness, and the notion of anonymity are being used to undermine our democracy and our civil liberties. As AI enhances and augments, and in some cases outpaces human capabilities, human-machine interaction is reimagining the future of work. At the same time, the very nature of employment is evolving. Skill cycles are shorter uh, than ever before. Consider for a moment that according to a recent study, 65% of the jobs that Generation Z will perform don't even exist today. This will have dramatic implications for educating the next generation. It's not just the scale and ubiquity of these advances uh, that are remarkable. The pace of advances, as well as the acceleration of their economic impact is also unparalleled in human history. As an example, it took landline phones about 45 years to go from 5% to 50% penetration among US households. By comparison, smartphones went from 5% to 40% in about just four years, and that was during a recession. And in 2017, that number reached more than 77%. Today, we're at an inflection point for the proliferation of AI, robotics, and automation. As this innovation moves forward at warp speed, our deployment of ethics, our development of ethics, I should say, and policy must keep up. Now, of course, is a time for partners from across public and private sectors to come together with affected communities to ensure that technology is used to benefit humanity individually, of course, as well as the entire society. As the university that has been intimately involved in the creation and evolution of artificial intelligence, we've definitely been responsible for some really groundbreaking innovations. But we've also built an interdisciplinary culture focused on making sure that technological progress benefits society. Through our partnerships with KNL Gates, as well as our Block Center for Technology and Society, which we just recently launched, CMU and our collaborators are helping to shape the world in which people, policy, and technology are better connected. Some of CMU's most passionate partners have been right here in Pittsburgh, which has been serving as a living laboratory for technology that is integrated with society. Our mayor, Bill Peduto, has been at the forefront of these collaborative efforts and has established himself as a national leader in progressive, inclusive, and sustainable innovation of American societies. I'm delighted that he's able to join us today to offer a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto. Bill? Thank you, Mr. President, and um, thank you to Carnegie Mellon University and KNL Gates uh, for taking on this issue and being able to have a discussion. And 
I also want to thank the person who wrote this speech for me because it's one of the best political speeches that I'm not going to read. Um, I always try to speak off the cuff, so let me explain what these next two days mean for policymakers. You know, Pittsburgh was an industry leader, right? The Industrial Revolution. During World War II, we produced more steel than Germany and Japan combined. And when we built out this industry and this great wealth that came to this region, it came at a very heavy cost. We had air that was dangerous to breathe. We had water that was poisonous to drink. And we had the greatest disparity between the people who worked in those mines and mills and those that owned and operated them. The greatest disparity in American history. And those were the costs that came with it and it would take decades and decades to be able to change that. Well, we did what Pittsburghers do. We created the first Clean Air Act in American history and we went about to clean our air. We created public-private partnerships in order to be able to clean our water. And we organized in those mines and in those mills and in the process of building America, every bridge and every skyscraper, we created the middle class. But they came as afterthoughts to the Industrial Revolution, not a component of the Industrial Revolution. So as we find ourselves today in the fourth Industrial Revolution, we have to look beyond simply what this technology can provide to venture capitalists out of California. We have to think about what it will provide to the people who live in cities throughout this country. We went through decades of redlining out neighborhoods based upon race and based upon income. We cannot redline out communities in this new economy based on whether or not you have a cell phone, whether you or not you have credit. We have to be able to make sure everybody is having that same opportunity and the technology will help us to expand it. We have to look beyond just what the technology will do and start to understand how it can minimize negative effects to the environment. And we have to look and see how it will enhance the places we call home. In Pittsburgh, we call it P4. People, planet, place, and performance. A new metric for a 21st century, not old economics of the 19th century. A quadruple bottom line of being able to understand how to measure success. And for policymakers, it's absolutely critical because when we look at the ethics of where AI can take us, it goes beyond purchasing drones for a city that will come up with issues of privacy or being able to throw a drone behind a wall and having somebody already have programmed when it takes a human life. At what point then do we start to think about creating machines and algorithms that have the ability to take a human life. We are at the forefront of all of this coming together and it's coming together so fast. But if we don't plan for the negative consequences in the beginning, we'll have made the mistake that we made in the Industrial Revolution and we will spend decades trying to solve those problems. Thank you very much, Bill, for your leadership and for making Pittsburgh be such an inclusive community. I'm, I'm happy to share with you that later this evening we'll, we'll celebrate the first two recipients of new professorships funded through the KNL Gates Endowment. These recipients exemplify interdisciplinary nature of these complex issues. The first is Ilo Norbach, who's an expert, of course, in our computer science. Uh, school, while the other, Molly Wright Stinson, investigates past and present implications of AI and computation on design and architecture with appointments in our School of Design and our School of Architecture. In addition, 
the K and L Gates Presidential Fellowship Endowed Fund will support four outstanding doctoral students, Veronica, Alante, Zachary, and Abigail, whom you'll meet later today, whose work spans information systems, computer science, engineering, public policy, and social and decision science. I'm delighted to congratulate these pioneering scholars on their prestigious professorship and scholarship. Please join me in congratulating all the awardees. As I mentioned earlier, we are truly fortunate to have k &L Gates as our partner, whose generous support will help, us, will help put us at the center of some of the most pressing conversations uh, facing society. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jim Segerdahl. As global managing partner, he serves as the firm's chief executive officer and native Pittsburgher, so he can tell you all about the weather. Jim is a board member of the Allegheny Conference for Community Development. Please join me in extending him a warm welcome to Jim Segerdahl. Thank you, President Jahanian. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a very exciting event. Uh, uh, just terrific to be in the company of so many brilliant people uh, working on truly important matters. Uh, I am pleased and honored to welcome all of you to the first inaugural conference of ethics and artificial intelligence, which I am proud to say is funded by the KNL Gates Endowment for Ethics and Computational Technologies. With this initiative, we honor not only our longstanding relationship with CMU, but also the commitment of both organizations to be at the forefront in furthering the understanding of the opportunities and the challenges presented by the ever-evolving role of technology in our society, including the role of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. Our law firm has had a long relationship with CMU over many decades, that relationship has been a source of tremendous pride for us. Although our core missions are different, we have worked together, shared civic involvement, and even shared leaders. For example, one of my predecessors as managing partner of K&L Gates, Chuck Queenan, is a former chair of the board at CMU. He's currently an emeritus trustee of the university and continues to provide wisdom and guidance to both of our organizations. With this conference, we have added another dimension to that relationship. As you know, it will be a biennial event and will be an opportunity that we hope will stimulate a great discussion and important dialogue. You might reasonably ask, why is the field of ethics and intelligence, artificial intelligence, important to k &L Gates, a law firm? It's a reasonable question. Our firm's work and our footprint is global as well as national. We like to think that we are a leader in the practice of law as it relates to technology, innovation, and development. We are fortunate to represent some of the leading technology entities in the world, as well as numerous startup companies that aspire to be in that sphere. We care about what our clients care about, and forward-looking clients everywhere care about artificial intelligence, and its potential impact on their businesses and society at large. Evidence of this is the fact that our artificial intelligence practice area now uh, comprises over 80 lawyers. The legal, the legal implications of the application of AI on our clients is broad, deep, and interdisciplinary. It will affect numerous different practice areas for us and for clients around the world, including mergers and acquisitions, health care, the protection of intellectual property, employment law, and a host of regulatory issues. Further, the practice of law itself is undergoing major shifts, and AI increasingly will be important to how legal services are delivered to clients. We approach what we do in a forward-looking way, with a forward-looking mindset. That's part of our DNA, and that's why we're so excited to be part of this important discussion and exchange of ideas. All of us know that advancements in computer-related technologies, many of them born of research here at Carnegie Mellon University, 
going back to Herb Simon and his colleagues, will increasingly bring about profound changes that affect our society and humanity in many ways. We can see that a critical dimension to many of the choices that will have to be made, whether implicitly or explicitly, as technology is, is developed, is the ethical dimension. And this is going to be important as our policymakers grapple with difficult issue as time goes on and as advances are made. We all have a stake in the outcome of these discussions, getting the best minds from across the relevant fields of study, from robotics to philosophy, in between and around, to focus on these problems is essential to addressing these matters efficiently and ethically. In making our gift to fund an endowment in ethics and computational technologies, we made an investment for the long term in an area important to us as a law firm and to society at large. With this conference, we are pleased to open this new forum for discussion and development of the important work of the speakers and participants. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy and benefit from the conference. Thank you, President Jehaney and uh, Mr. Segerdahl and Mayor Peduto. Uh, I'm David Danks, uh, Thurston Professor of Philosophy and Psychology here at CMU, and uh, co-chair of this event with Ila Norbosch, uh, currently Professor of Robotics for about another two hours, uh, at which point he becomes the inaugural k &L Gates Professor of Ethics and Computational Technologies. And uh, it is our great pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural conference on ethics and AI uh, here in Pittsburgh. I want to say a few words about why this conference needs to happen now and why it has to have the format that it has. No doubt you're all well aware that artificial intelligence has reached fever pitch in society today. Thanks to certain companies, what they've done in terms of rushing forth with deployments in the real world, and thanks to discourse by outstanding investigative journalists who have turned the public's attention to these issues. But the people in this room know something else because many of our friends who are here, from policymakers to business folks to researchers, are flying around the world at a breakneck pace now between meetings and other meetings, discussing regulation, discussing entrepreneurship and venture capital funding to AI, discussing the question of how we engineer ethics into artificial intelligence systems. And all those meetings are fantastic and must happen. But this meeting has to happen because there's a fundamental question that is actually inherently transdisciplinary. What will artificial intelligence do to our sense of human identity? What will we be in the age that we can see already on the horizon? That's the fundamental question of identity and the fundamental question of human dignity. And those are the issues that we will grapple with during this conference. So we've designed a conference for you that brings together outstanding journalists and experts and sets them up not to talk within disciplinary confines, but rather to talk in a transdisciplinary manner about the core issues of identity, of humanity itself. That's a conversation that we think has to start now and has to repeat over and over again. So that's the conversation that you're part of and that we're very happy to welcome you to. But enough about the, uh, the highfalutin stuff. Uh, some logistical notes very quickly. Um, you'll notice on all of the tables that there are cubes that have the schedule, have uh, information about Wi-Fi for those who are interested in that, Twitter hashtag, and so forth. Throughout the, uh, the conference over the next two days, there will be opportunities for you as members of the audience to participate in terms of providing questions for panelists to answer. Uh, that will all be done using a technology referred to as Slido, an app, uh, and there will be some more information provided about that as we get to the first panel. Uh, the conference is being live streamed, uh, so if there are people that you know wanted to participate but were unable to be here, please let them know about that. And the conference elements will all, uh, over the coming weeks, be rolled out on the web page, so we encourage you to continue to look back at that. Okay, back to the important things. Uh, this conference, as Ila said, is about having a conversation of the ways that technology, particularly AI and robotic technologies, are influencing, impacting, providing opportunities and challenges for us humans, for societies, for nations, for peoples. 
And in particular, we've decided to organize this conference around four different sessions, each of which is anchored in a particular human interest or human value. So rather than having a session on AI and self-driving cars, we have sessions on equity of access and equity of impact, trust, policy and governance, and agency and empowerment, which we hope will help to focus the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary conversations around these core human values and interests uh, so that we can start to make real progress over the course of the coming days. And so uh, with that said, I'd like to turn things over to Ila to introduce the first session. Thank you, David. Session one, we're gonna dive right into this. Equity of access and equity of impact. So let me just say 30 seconds about that. One of the interesting things about artificial intelligence and computational technologies writ large is that they can increase the apparent productivity of human society. They can allow us to do more. They can allow us new kinds of discoveries, new spaces to, in which we can discover and uh, create new knowledge. The challenge with that form of innovation is, of course, stemming from the fact that AI and information itself has ownership. And as a result, as you create new AI technologies, new innovations, you have the danger that you can limit the access to that AI technology to the few. You have the further danger that you can, in fact, augment the wealth of the few through those very same technologies, thus increasing disparity between the, those who have and those who have not. So fundamentally, we have, on the one hand, technology that can make the world a better place on average. At the same time, we have a technology that, while the average case might be better, the extrema might be far worse. And so that fundamental challenge in terms of both access and in terms of how the world as a whole is impacted by AI, that's the focus of our first session. Now, each of our sessions is structured differently, so we think you're gonna enjoy that. There are spotlight speakers, there are videos that help to set the stage, and there are panel discussions. In this session, we're gonna start with a video, and I'm gonna ask to cue that right away, and then I'll introduce the spotlight speaker to get things started. So let's run with the video, please. really, as engineers, need to take responsibility to work on the things that will make the world a better place. Taking responsibility, having a research strategy instead of just going wherever your curiosity takes you. AI and optimization have very different strengths than humans do. Humans are really good at actually figuring out what the ends are, what the value judgments are in general, how it should trade off between different things like various forms of efficiency and various forms of fairness. But humans think of them in the context of special cases. And humans are very bad at actually sifting through all of the possible special cases of which there are more than the number of atoms in the universe. We developed this new framework which we call Future Match, where we take as input the human's value judgments and then using AI-based simulation and past data, uh, we can actually optimize the policy parameters as to how do you best achieve those goals. So we're separating the means and the ends. The humans are talking about the ends and the AI is figuring out the means. And I think that this is a very important separation for the future in many different areas of AI. That's Thomas Sandholm, our colleague right here at Carnegie Mellon University in the School of Computer Science. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker. He's gonna set the stage for about 20 minutes and then we're gonna have a little discussion in the uh, comfortable armchairs in the middle. Um, our first speaker is Oshonde Oshoba and I'm happy to welcome him to the stage. Oshonde is an engineer at Rand Corporation and he's a professor at the Pardee Rand School. His background is perfect for this. His background is in machine learning, optimization, control, but he's also branched from machine learning into health, defense, and technology policy. So from there, he's gone to data privacy and accountability. So you, you, you notice I mentioned pretty much all the key words as we look at the way AI integrates into society. Before joining RAND, Oshunde was at USC and indeed got his PhD there in electrical engineering. And without further ado, welcome Oshunde. All right. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about equity of access and equity of impact and how artificial intelligence um, mediates, transforms, affects those two things. Uh, <clears throat> I will be suggesting 
that we look to the past, look to antiquity, to sort of help us see what's going on in the future. Um, I want us to focus on these two individuals, um, Plato and Socrates. My contention is that the interaction, the differences in the way these two people work, kind of sort of prefigures our complexities, the complexities we're dealing with today when it comes to AI and equity. Um, if there is a key takeaway point from, from this conversation, I hope it would be the idea of participatory equity. I will be making the contention that that should be the foundation of any successful infrastructure for ethically aligned artificial or, or fair AI. Uh, now that I've given you the key point, uh, we can all take naps, basically. Uh, back to Plato. <clears throat> so the mental image I have of Plato is of this undoubted genius. But he's also this guy who's deeply, deeply scarred by one pivotal event in his life. And that's the, the state-sanctioned execution of his teacher and mentor, Socrates. Socrates, <laughs> Plato reacts to that event by retreating from the marketplace of ideas, from the, from the population, from the community. And he sets up this, he sets up this archetype for the solitary contemplative philosopher. And he, he designs these utopias in which uh, basically the demos, the people that he, that he kind of pulls back from are sort of always subject to some philosopher king. And that's his idea of what a fair society is. And he does this without engaging with the people at all. He just designed this from the beginning. Now, contrast this to how Socrates does inquiry. He engages deeply and very, very critically with the community he's, engaged, he's around when he, asked, when he has to answer the simple question, what is wisdom? Now, he doesn't get his answer. He doesn't get a definite, definitive answer from that question, from that interaction. But at least he can claim some defense against the biases that his personal perspective necessarily brings to that conversation. Think about how these two men might have thought about the questions that lay before us today. The idea of equity, what is equity? And how do algorithmic decision-making artifacts interact with equity? Um, Aristotle makes a, a, an appearance in discussions of equity also, but we won't focus on him today. <clears throat> Back in the day, a few months ago, I was introduced as an, as an engineer of fairness. Uh, that's a little bit of a paradoxical title. Engineers have this image of being objective, precise analysts, while fairness is this very contextual, very socially defined, very fuzzy concept that's slippery to define. I argue that any, any discussion of artificial intelligence and equity is going to be doomed to this compresence of opposite qualities. It used to be that uh, when we talked about AI equity, people would sneer at us. They'd say things like, well, what is equity? in the same way that Pontius Pilate probably asked, uh, what is truth? In typical conversations about AI policy, they were focused on these future-looking scenarios, these terminator scenarios, these uh, existential crises. And I would argue that, that that focus, that's a product of a privileged perspective, a perspective that cannot imagine the problems of AI affecting us today, they have to look to the future to, see, to imagine things that go wrong. Now, that is probably a lazy argument, so I'll offer a, a reconciliation. So here we have um, Hawkins along, um, pushing that line of inquiry. Let me offer a reconciliation by observing that questions of AI equity and AI safety, existential safety concerns, they actually share a common root. For example, they are concerned with value alignment. By value alignment, I mean how do we design algorithms that, that um, support societally defined norms. They also share the problem of explainability. In the, in the interest of, of procedural transparency, we would like to be able to derive stable, robust, meaningful explanations from the algorithmic decision-making artifacts. But let's focus on equity. When we focus on equity, there are <clears throat> there, are, there are these definitional problems. There are these issues, these um, perceived aperture in the definition of equity. And it's a great thing that we now have examples 
that in spite of the arbitrary, in spite of definition of problems, they're able to demonstrate examples of algorithms violating socially defined equity norms. These examples have done us a deep and, and huge service of kind of sort of challenging that deep slumber of settled opinion that algorithms are necessarily fair and infallible. In fact, we have researchers now saying that any, any technological design necessarily embeds ethical decisions, necessarily embeds values, either implicitly or explicitly. When we talk about AI equity, we, those conversations turn on how those values align with societally defined expectations of fairness. So, <clears throat> Uh, the first is the street bump example, the second is the compass recidivism, and the third is insurance price. And the last two examples were sort of, um, were the result of ProPublica's explorations. Let's try to examine how biases might seep into our supposedly objective, infallible algorithms. We are probably familiar with how AI systems are designed. There's usually a design phase, a programming phase, a training phase, and a testing phase. But right here, in the design of an algorithmic artifact to make a decision, we have situations where we have framing artifacts, framing effects. When you design a system to make decisions and you focus and you frame it as an optimization on predictive accuracy, it shouldn't be surprising when you have fairness, fairness problems with that, with that design. Besides the, the actual framing effects in the design, you have inputs that, you, that are used to design the systems. These usually consist of data, and assumptions, at least in modern statistical machine learning uh, models. Uh, older AI models, they relied more on rules and assumptions, expert elicited rules and assumptions. But even in these inputs, you have this problem, and I'm using terms from behavioral economics to help us maybe frame this better. We have this problem of naive realism, where the model assumes that the data it it's, it's able to see is a complete contextual representation of the real world. So you can imagine a, a model trained on a subset of the population assuming that the general population to which it's going to be applied looks like that training set. That's a form of naive realism. Or you can imagine uh, an algorithm trying to make inferences about people's networks based on just social media links, assuming that social media links represent the full state of connections in the real world. That's a form of naive realism. We also have this issue of anchoring biases. Statistical models, they tend to basically anchor on examples they've seen in the past. This is an example of a generalization error problem. And so by anchoring on those examples in the future when it's presented with things it's not familiar with, you have these anchors that kind of sort of help. Sometimes they help, sometimes they're not so good. The last part where biases can seep in uh, is in the outcomes. So we have this issue we might call outcome bias or automation bias, where we assume that the process, the outcome of a, of a decision-making artifact characterized the quality of the, of the decision-making artifact. It's just like the, the key example here might be saying, well, a broken clock is correct twice a day. If you observe it only at those two points of the day, you think it's, it's working perfectly. But you're not thinking about the process by which it's getting those decisions. You're not questioning whether that's correct or not. So this is just a, a framing I might suggest for how we might think about how biases, inequities seep into algorithmic decision-making artifacts. Let's try to be, um, I'm gonna to try to present two examples, two case studies, where we can examine how an algorithm might have to deal with equity concerns. The first is the use of algorithms in criminal justice. Example applications of the use of algorithms as reflected in a COMPASS report is the use of algorithms for setting bills and for sentencing. It used to be that COMPASS was mainly for setting bail. Increasingly, there was a feature creep where it was increasingly used for sentencing. Now, the frame I'm going to use to talk about these case studies is, is something I'm hoping we can take away from this conversation. Every time we think about algorithms in decision making, we should think about the problem it's trying to solve, in this case, bail, bail setting and sentencing. But we should also be explicit about the guiding norms, the equity norms that the, that the decision-making artifact is subject to. In the context of criminal justice, I would argue that we have at least two norms, the equal protection norm um, guaranteed by the US Constitution, at least in the United States, and you might also argue for the due process norm guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment rights. The second example, the second case study, the second domain will be algorithms in insurance. Insurance represents this, um, 
it solves this social function of safeguarding people from catastrophic risk. And so it's not surprising that insurers might want to use algorithms to help them make their, make their decisions more accurate, more fair. Example applications, example problems here are the problems of rate setting and underwriting. Rate setting is just really about setting the price of, a, of an insurance premium. Underwriting is kind of sort of gauging the, the risk the risk tranches for people who are supposed to be insured. Now, what would be the, insurance, the, the guiding norm in this situation? This is a bit more complicated, and I'd argue that the actuarial standards body of the United States says, well, your insurance prices should be actuarially fair, i.e., the cost of an insurance premium should reflect underlying risk of the person. But then we have these issues when we start asking for universal health care mandates, universal insurance mandates, and you have to worry about affordability being part of the norms here. Now, in a market setting, that might be a problem. And these are questions we'll have to tease out as we, as we think about equity going forward. Let's try to use these case studies to tease out more general ideas. Well, the very first idea, the very first theme is that Equity norms are necessarily context-specific. That's an almost obvious st statement. But that obvious statement kind of undermines our expectation that maybe there is this prescriptive mathematical definition of equity that we just need to impose on our algorithms to make them fair. That's probably not going to happen. And we can actually add more to we can actually add more context, more complexity to this, to this um, issue of the existence of prescriptive equity norms. Um, work by, I hope I'm pronouncing the name properly, Shoda Shova and uh, uh, Kleinberger and Molly Nathan, they are addressing, they are identifying what we might call weak impossibility theorems. That if you have a set of, a set of mathematically defined equity norms that you would hope your decision-making artifact respect, in this case, group calibration, um, equality of negative false positive or false negative rates, equality of false positive rates. There is something inherently incompatible in trying to achieve all three equity norms. And the conversations a few, a few months, a few weeks ago at uh, the FAT ML conference extended this to any collection of equity, mathematically defined equity norms, trying to satisfy more than three, and three or more is, is impossible. We can call that an, a weak impossibility theorem. Now you might hear this and think, well, since I can't have it all, let me just have, let me have my users vote to decide which, is, which ones are important. But then we run into impossibility theorems, the stronger impossibility theorems by Kenneth Arrow, Gibbard, and Seth Tweet, saying essentially, it, impossible to reasonably aggregate collective normative preferences. All right, so that's the second theme. The third theme I'm trying to, I've been trying to develop over the past year or, so, or two thinking about this is this framing of allocation problems, distribution problems as entitlement programs versus market programs. We can think about it as, as a spectrum. Entitlement distribution pro programs, they are distribution problems in which there are clear equity norms guiding the decision process, the distribution, distributive decision process. Normative clarity usually means that there is some law, some regulation that everybody accepts that determines how fair a decision is. You can think about the example of United States criminal justice. You have the a public good, law enforcement, that's being distributed to the public under the normative guidelines of equal protection and due process. But we, we also have what we might think of as market programs. Market distribution programs are just distribution programs where equity norms play little or no role, and the distributive action is determined largely by the intersection of demand and supply. Now, let's try to figure out questions that come up from this. In entitlement programs, you have the question of, are the norms necessarily equitable? And if they're not equitable, are there remedies for it? Um, social movements like Black Lives Matter and civil rights movements, they are essentially challenges to the equity norms, the ruling equity norms at the time. And we have this saying essentially that legality is not really a question of justice, it's a question of power. When we switch over to the market session, you have this issue of, there is a trade-off between the accuracy, the efficiency of the market, and the imposition of equity norms. 
If you try to make a market fair according to some of the equity norms, you can often impose a deadweight cost. What is essentially a deadweight cost? The question becomes, who gets to bear that burden? And how big is that burden? That sounds theoretical high value In concrete terms, you can think about it in terms of the mar insurance market. In health insurance, if you have a universal mandate, who gets to bear the cost of that increase in, in risk just because you have a universal mandate? Less controversially, in, insur in auto insurance markets, who gets to bear that cost? Those are questions we have to tackle with, we have to grapple with, if we really care about equity in algorithmic decision-making systems. All right, I feel like I've been a bit negative about the, the prospect of algorithmic equity. Let's try to see if I can pull out a more positive vision from the rubble. <clears throat> We've, I've been poking holes in the idea that you can actually define prescriptive equity norms mathematically and impose them on your algorithms. And even if such a thing existed, you will still need the buy-in of your subjects, of your users. That is not easy to, to, to maintain, to receive in a dictatorial dicta uh, technocracy. So this suggests that maybe we should be thinking more about participatory versions, participatory models of AI equity. Basically, these will be models in which your, your users, which constantly um, query your users for equity concerns. When we talk about diversity in the rank, this is the diversity point, you knew it was coming, so whatever. When we talk about diversity in the ranks of algorithmic designers, we are not just pleading special circumstances. It's precisely because by having more, more diversity in the rank of designers, you're pulling in more social perspectives to inform the design process. But even diversity, diversifying, is not enough because if you think about it, algorithms are always necessarily going to, well, are generally going to affect more people than are being represented in the designer class. So, what you're going to need is something that allows for, for more participation from wider groups. And we can sharpen this point by observing that equity challenges, equity concerns, they are a distributed form of, of knowledge. There is no single controlling group that's ever going to be able to coordinate the transmission and accommodation of equity challenges. So we need more participation. Basically, we need more, more, more Socrates and fewer Plato's designing from, from isolation. We need people who are going to go out there and do the messy work of engaging with the subject. And this is where I'm reminded again of Shoulder Shova's work on the Allegheny County child welfare system. It's really good work, which is why I'm talking about it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> besides the participatory model, uh, we might want to think about Instead of prescriptive norms, we might want to think about infrastructures for imposing, for enabling and designing equity into algorithmic decision-making systems. This is kind of sort of the GDPR route. Instead of trying to impose norms, you impose, you, you define an infrastructure that enables good behavior to, to happen. Now, we might want to ask ourselves, what are the key, the minimal key components of such an infrastructure? I want to argue for three, or well, three or four. Fluency, we need more fluency in the principles of equity. So the economist Peyton Young puts it this way, equity principles, these norms I've been going on about, and the mathematical definitions of these norms, they are really just instruments. They're not ends in themselves that we just impose in an algorithm. They are really instruments by which society kind of sort of uh, adjudicates equity problems, distributive problems, especially when efficiency, market efficiency fails as a, as a criterion. Now, if we are not fluent in the language of equity principles, we are going to have problems properly adjudicating and responding to equity concerns. Uh, the second one under which I'll, I'll combine the two, transparency and dissent, I think primarily it's about dissent. You need any implementation, any algorithmic implementation to have basically settled avenues for, for enabling dissent, for collecting dissent from the users. Uh, part of that dissent procedure will probably require transparency about the norms governing the, area, the, the domain. 
And thirdly, and I think this is the part that fails, especially in privacy conversations, you need methods for accountable redress. You need to be able to have institutions be able to make and keep promises. You need incentives to allow that to happen. Usually, at least according to GDP, GDPR, GDPR basically says, well, the way to do that is by having these steep fines. And I'm inclined to agree because we have a history of data breaches that, have, that has not abated in spite of the small fines we've been having so far. These are the ideas I have out there. Um, I, I will admit that my conversation has been from a very uh, allocative distribution perspective. Uh, I, I, I want to acknowledge Kate Crawford's uh, perspective that uh, besides allocative problems, you have representational harms that come from using algorithms in, in society. Um, when, those allocate, when, those, when algorithms that have that represent the proper distribution in society, this disparate distributions in society, are now responsible for shaping our preferences. What does that mean long term? That's all I have for you. Thank you. Now we get to relax and talk. Take any chair as long as it's one of the middle two. <laughs> That's like a fair allocation problem. It's an equitable allocation <laughs> of shares, that's right. So, fascinating talk. Um, we have a few questions we're gonna ask everybody, but I have to drill into what you said first. Okay. Um, first of all, you know, when you talked about weak and strong impossibility, there was a point there that I think it's important to reiterate for the audience, so I wanna ask you to build on it a little bit. Mm. Because this idea that mathematically uh, achieving a computational way of encoding the norms of equity such that the computer system itself, the robot, the mm -hmm. AI system, can execute and guarantee that. Mm -hmm. What I heard you say is that that's essentially impossible. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we can all, we can all talk about, okay, we want um, equal, we can, always, we can make arguments for certain equity principles to be enforced in algorithms, but uh, at some point, a group is going to argue and say, actually, the outcome on our end is, is violating what we think is fair, and you're going to have to accommodate that non-theoretical, that very practical, messy equity concern, and that probably means moving away from mathematically precise definitions of equity and trying to kind of engage with them. Um, I, I, I think um, the le judge Leonard Han, he put it this way, he said equity concerns, well, Equity is really just about the, the, the uncomfortable accommodation of, con of, of conflict to this society. Trying to do that in a precise mathematical way might not be a robust solution long term. This reminds me of uh, talking to urban designers who say there's this thing called the wicked problem. You can't optimize because this is a social challenge. Exactly. And this also reminds me of the defense argument that says we'll make the perfect robot soldier argument against which is, no, actually, even war is social. We mm -hmm. can't optimize it quantitatively. Yep, yep. Well, so this is interesting. Um, if it's the case that we can't actually hope for an AI system that will make the world equitable by the very nature of how it's programmed, then you talked about participatory equity, yep. which I love. Except when I look at a system like Facebook or AdWords on Google, what I see is participatory systems. Mm -hmm. And what I see in those systems is, since no system is equitably perfect, so to speak, people find a way to hack them. Yep. And then use their own yep. asymmetric levers of power yep. to hack the very participatory system you created to do mm -hmm. things like throw, say, mm -hmm. I don't know, an election. <laughs> so That's not how funny, do we but deal with is, hackability? Uh, so, uh, I would argue that maybe the, the, the issue is probably mechanism design, learning to, to put in incentives in, in platforms that allow, that allow for this type of, for correcting for these types of evolutionary behaviors over time. Uh, trying to a priori design a perfect system, that's like you're saying, it's not gonna happen. So it's about incent structuring the incentives, creating an infrastructure for, for, for modifying them over time. So then here's my, my fear. Um, I totally get that. We're going to make systems. We'll make them as, as good as we can. People will misuse them. There will mm -hmm. be bad actors. And we're going to respond. We're going to have a rapid reaction yep. to that. But here's my concern. The AI systems we're talking about are inherently accumulating and concentrating power mm -hmm. and knowledge, which means the bad actor's ability to negatively influence reality, it's big and mm -hmm. only bigger next mm -hmm. year and the year after. Mm -hmm. so it, it seems to me by the time we catch them, the crimes get worse mm. before we do the redress or the mm -hmm. fix. 
So my, don't we have this weird runaway problem? Yes, yes, yes. So my, so I, I've, these, are, these are problems I think about every day and I talk about with my with fellow researchers at RAN. And one of my fellow researchers, I dislike the solution, but I, I, I don't see a way around it. One of my fellow researchers, Rand Waltzman, he argues that the way to, to, to address this is to have an adversarial reaction. So um, the first person, the bad actors do something like flood, in, flood the net with, with resonant neg um, fake news. And the solution is for the good actors to flood the net with resonant true, true, true uh, news. And the idea is how to, is basically this back and forth between, between actors. I see that as a runaway situation. Yeah. Uh, but thinking of solutions is hard. <laughs> So that really scares me. That's a good way to start the conference because we clearly need the conference. So let me <laughs> jump on my extreme level of fear now that I have mm. to the three questions we're hoping to ask everybody because oh uh, this gives us a neat thread to push throughout the whole conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you answered one of them already, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Uh, the first question, I really want to narrow your view and unfortunately cause you to prognosticate a little bit into the future. I want to look at the next 10 years. Mm. And I want to ask the question, what is the thing you're most excited about vis-a-vis -vis AI and equity? What, are, what is something you can imagine that is actually doable in the next 10 years where AI can actually help with questions of equity? Oh, that's a good one. We didn't share these with the speakers ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... I think uh, we're already seeing this happening. Maybe 10 years is too far out. The issue of credit allocation, credit scoring for thin file, for thin file subjects, people who don't have um, large records in, large formal records in the economic sectors. So this would be like people in developing countries, poor people. Um, the ability to use artificial intelligence to, uh, I try to use the term algorithms as opposed to artificial intelligence as often as I can. The ability to use machine learning methods to, to learn about credit score, about credit worthiness from all the sources of data seems to me, uh, extremely powerful when if, if properly applied and properly um, supervised because you can also use that type of, of scoring mechanism for other things like uh, the China the Chinese approach of, right. of social scoring but just enabling better credit to people in, in poor situations is a huge transformative thing I think and I love that answer because it also brings into the play the whole question of developing world and mm -hmm. ways in which developing world may access what we're yeah. talking about yeah. so the second question is the exact opposite Oh, well. Again, limiting ourselves to 10 years or so, what is it that most uh, keeps you up at night in terms of equity and AI? Mm, I don't sleep regularly, so you know. <laughs> uh, I, I tend to avoid projects involving um, hard defense because it makes me really anxious. And the question of deterrence in a world in which we have um, AI-enabled weapons makes me worried. And worse than that, it's not just the existence of the weapons that makes me worried. It's the, ex it's the differences in the culture, in the cultures deploying those weapons. If you think about the Chinese, the, the Chinese uh, approach to defense and the American approach to, de to defense, you have basically China seeming to be more trusting of just wholesale, fully automated weapons. And you have um, United States doctrine saying something to the effect that we'll always have humans in the loop. That, that, that makes sense from a, that, that, that seems comfortable, comforting from a unilateral perspective. But imagine a, a situation in which uh, a country has humans in the loop for all the autonomous systems and uh, the other country just doesn't care. That seems to have deterrence implications that are difficult to think about. So lack of parity may actually yep. force a good actor to become yep. less good. Yep. Indeed. Last question for you um, is an interesting futuring question that's kind of navel-gazing about this conference. Mm. So imagine we're here 15 years from now having this conference. Mm -hmm. How will it look or feel different because of AI? <laughs> I assume most people will not actually be here, would have bots and telepresence. So we'll just be talking to a, a set of screens yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like this idea, and I maybe, I, I mean, I'm trying to imagine how that would apply in a conference setting. I like this idea of uh, Clark and Chalmers' extended mind. I feel like most of us will be more invested in the tools that enable us to engage with the world. And so maybe we'll have uh, augmented brains of some sort. 
that make us faster thinkers. I always think about how to think faster, how to think more creatively, and I imagine that artificial intelligence will probably enable that in the future. So cognitive orthotics for us all, maybe. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful speech. Thank you. Thank you.